to you as sociological an estimate as I can of one of the great events of modern times, the completion of a cycle, the moving back of the people of the book, Israel, into the great static world of Mediterranean culture. I'm going to ask you to remember the map of the Mediterranean world. It comprises two great arcs, the northern arc and the southern arc. The northern arc reaches from Cape St. Vincent in Portugal to the Dardanelles. And that great arc is under the spell of two great historic religions. And then there's the southern arc, reaching from Casablanca to Cairo and on lands of the Tigris Euphrates Valley. We shall extend the Mediterranean world to go as far east as troubled Iran. I think it can be fairly said of this great area, this inland sea, this Mediterranean sea, that this is a land of piety where there is no pity. I think we can say that this land, these two great arcs, are characterized by ten distinctive Mark. I'm going to rehearse them very briefly. What I have to say runs the risk of oversimplification. It can't be helped. The first one is priestcraft, the rule of the sheikh and the friar. In living and traveling in this land, one is reminded whether on the northern arc or the southern arc of the Mediterranean, one is reminded of the vertical dimension of religious faith. The vertical, the transcendent dimension of religious faith, and of a paradoxical poverty of the lateral dimension of religious faith, compassion and pity. The second place this land is characterized by otherworldliness, an absolute radical mysticism. The third place, the quality of ethics which invariably accompanies these two. Resignation to present evil, alternating with a desperate opportunism, a catch-as-catch-can, a grab-as-grab-can way of living. It's a subsistence economy. The whole great Mediterranean world, the northern arc and the southern arc, is a bare subsistence level economy. Those people are marked. Whether you're traveling in France, in France Spain, or Portugal, France to the less degree, to the least degree, but in all the other countries, those people are marked by an ordination in their spirit of defeatism, pessimism, tragic fatalism, alternating with outbursts of animal egoism, born of a struggle for existence where there is no organized pity for others to help, and where intelligence cannot meet intelligence, where a man of the utmost intelligence and refinement is as alone in his culture as the great blind Egyptian scholar, scholar Taha Hussein, the greatest poet of that area. Third to the fourth place, this great pair of arcs, the great northern arc, the great southern arc, are characterized by ignorance. They are characterized in the fifth place by that inevitable consequence of ignorance, disease. You remember that passage in the, in the Dickens Christmas Carol where the two terrible children are brought out from beyond? From the, under the skirt of the ghost of Christmas present, one of them is want and the other is ignorant. In the sixth place, this great pair of arts is characterized by the subservience of women, by the subservience of women, and in the seventh place, by the unlimited procreation of children, and in the eighth place, by the exploitation of children, and in the ninth place, one of the dread symbols of disintegration, acute deforestation, the failure of trees to come back and grow, and all of the social consequences of the denuding of the earth of trees. Those of you who have studied, and it would be well worth your while to study it, those of you who have studied the history of the Dalmatian coast know what once the Dalmatian coast looked like. And in the tenth place and final place, the feudal control of the land. Three great landowners own one-third of Spain today. And I could give you figures 
prepared by the uh, uh, Arabian, the Egyptian Ministry of Land, to show you the extent of the control of land in all of the Arab countries. This is the area of the lottery. This is the area of the lottery. That fatalistic reaction to social needs. I put on the blackboard in front of you something to help you organize your thinking. Not that I expect you're following me entirely, but here is a list of the ten basic institutions of human life, the ten things that people want to do that are clothed with emotion, beginning with marriage and ending with what H.G. Wells called the shape of things to come. I propose that we go down this morning to answer of Islam and the answer of Judaism and see what those answers are in just as temperate and objective terms as we can. We will begin with marriage. I assume we all want to get married. What is the answer of Islam? The answer of Islam is still polygamy, the subservience of women, the unlimited procreation of children. Polygamy is vanishing today in the Arab world, but the Quran still permits a man to have four wives, and he can secure a divorce from any one of these by simply saying to her, Three times, I will have none of thee, I will have none of thee, I will have none of thee. And she takes her children unless the children can be used in the field as farm labor. She takes them on the street and she sells the girls into prostitution and she sells the boys to, into bondage to some pagan for, for uh, thievery. Islam's relationship, in Islam today, the relationship of the male to the female is characterized by the autocracy of the male. And one of the most tragic events that the preceptresses of the Western colleges, the Western missionary colleges in the Arab countries tell me occurs, is the retrogression of the girls trained in those colleges and sent to American and British institutions. They slide back into the old relationship of subservience. The answer of Judaism is monogamy, with all that it means, the equality of women and planned parenthood. Children are born of marriage, altogether too many, for this world, this area of surplus population. What is the answer of Islam to its unlimited procreation of children? Exploitation and degradation neglect in the early years, and exploitation in adolescence. The death rate in Egypt is 248, the infant mortality is 248 per thousand. 248 children born during, uh, die during the first 12 months of what should have been their calendar of life. Little children, as soon as they can hold a mud hook or a fork are sent into the field, and they are paid between seven and eight cents a day as laborers. In the big cities, Alexandria and Cairo, there are at least 100,000 weights. You can't call them a constant caseload in American social work sense because nobody takes care of them. They are merely statistics, horrendous statistics for those who fear that their pockets will be picked or they'll be slugged in a dark street by some of the older and the more venturesome of these children. When I was last in Cairo, they were having the annual debate about the compulsory education law, and the attorneys for the vast landowners rose in the Chamber of Deputies and said these following words, you cannot pass a compulsory education law in Egypt. The children of the fellah, those are the peasants, the children of the fellah are the principal economic resource of our agricultural population. The answer of Judaism is consecration of all to the child. Consecration of all the resources of health, all the resources of education. The first buildings built for the people who are coming in today at the rate of a thousand a day from all over the troubled world to live in Israel. The first buildings are buildings built for children. All schools are filled with vice, vital, eager students. Those of us who are Christians can remember the two great instances in Jesus' life which show how Jewish his background was. 
the welcome by the teachers in the temple to the young boy who could talk with them. And in that last week, his summoning the little children to him and warning the older people of the millstone. So the perfectly natural, that lovely attitude toward children continues today. And I could tell you stories to prove it. The answer of Islam is exploitation, degradation, neglect. The answer of Judaism is the care of all, the devotion of all to the child. Now the life of the mind is an institution. The life of the mind, this great university is dedicated to the life of the mind. The life of the mind in the Western world is an institution. It has validity and objective claim upon us. What is the answer of Islam to the, to the problem of what shall we do for the life of the mind? How shall we organize for the life of the mind? This is the answer of Islam. 87% illiteracy. 13% literacy. I was just talking with one of the great socialist leaders of India. How I wish you could hear him. Dr. Lohar. He said, in the vast populated land of Egypt, their illiteracy burden is 86%. They shade the Arab world by 1%. There are in Egypt no schools except the Sheikh school. I was once talking with a monogamous Egyptian who spoke perfect English. He lived in the English and the Swedish world for a long time. He and his wife had four children. He was raising two to be illiterate, and he was raising two to learn how to read. He sold wristwatches to the British soldiers at the little town of Zagazig. Zagazig. Sounds like something out of Kipling. On the Nile, going up to Alex. And I said to him, how did you arrive at the choice of the two children who should learn to read and communicate with the, with the world in which they're living? Why, he said, Mr. Sharp, I can't make enough money. The Sheikh charges me five pounds a month for the education of the two children. My wife and I have had four children. We love them dearly. We can only hope that those two who can read in the private Sheikh school can teach the others how to read. He said to me, some of the more thoughtful British soldiers asked me, why don't you start a revolution? And he said to me, do you realize that we can't communicate with anybody in, in the Arab world with whom we cannot talk? We cannot read anything. Only 13, 14 percent of us can read. And if I were to start a social revolution here, I would have to communicate orally. I would have to talk with a man who would come, and the railroad fares for forbid it if the censors and the police officers didn't. I would have to talk. We would have to get together. We can't communicate. We can't read revolutionary documents. The broadcasting, the broadcasting in the Arab world is chiefly in the language, the classical Arabic. No wonder that people can't buy anything. And so for the most part, they can't understand what is said to them over the air. And the only communication which is possible for this great body of 87% of the people of the Arab world is the communication by word of mouth. All the symbolism, all the symbolism of words is a dark continent to them. But what about the great university of Azhar in Cairo? There are two universities, Suad University in the West and Al Azhar. In Al Azhar, the great university where rote and tradition and the sing-song method of learning obtains today, you see scholars who have not done a productive day's work in their lives who are 80 and 90. They have been in this institution sitting on little hassocks, singing and half screaming all their lives the majestic ethical precepts and religious mysticism of the Quran. Maintained there in this parasitical scholar's existence. What is the answer of Judaism? Compulsory, free, complete education for every child climaxed in study in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Take the scientific outlook. Out of the life of the mind comes or may not come. The scientific outlook. And what is the answer of Islam to the problem of how shall, how shall man's relationship to his adversities be rationalized? That seems to me to be the question involved in the scientific outlook. The answer of Islam is inshallah, or marshallah, supporting the Arabic concept of mekhub, M-E-K-T-U-B, which means fatalism, expressed by the French in the southern part of France by the word, je m'en fiche, inshallah, 
mashallah. Resignation, the shrugged shoulders, the hands uplifted, the gesture of fatalism and hopelessness. When a child is born with some loathsome, crippling disease, like a club foot, if the child can live, the child is put upon the streets to exploit his deformity and serve as a source of income for the family. And this is about as far as they can go toward rationalizing the accidents of birth and of disease. It is a world of acquiescence, a world of defeatism. It's a precedent-ridden land where because things have been done for 18 centuries, they all continue to be done. It's a land which the lawyers would describe and the agronomists would join them. It's a land of waste and strip, where every inflammable thing is burned. They burn even the droppings of the cattle, which is a terrible thing to do for a land that has lost its humor. The land of unchecked disease. The World Health Office or, uh, estimates that 40% of the rural Iraqi have syphilis. 50% of the rural Egyptian peasants have Bilharzia, which is an incurable hemorrhage disease of the inner organs of the body caused by persons, illiterate persons, disregarding the signs upon the canal and swimming in water in which a microorganism is traveling that has lived a part of its life cycle in the body of the snail, part of its life cycle in the body of the dog, and then comes to live in the liver and the kidneys of men. This doesn't kill unless a person gets tuberculosis or some other cooperating disease, but it leads to debilitation. And 50%, close to 50% of the rural population of this illiterate area, close to 50%, have bilharzia, dysphosmiosis. What's the answer of Islam? The answer of Islam is the exploitation of scientific properties and relationships. Relentless exper experimentalism. I don't know whether you know it or not, but sometime you ought to ask somebody up in Chicago to send you down, unless your library has it, the film called House in the Desert, which tells the story of how a young Jewish pioneer with 148 youth Aliyah kids discovered how to drive the salt out of the sands of the Dead Sea and there to raise tomatoes, lettuce, pineapples, sugar cane. These are the shores of the Dead Sea with a 17% salinity in the earth, and it took relentless experimentalism, relentless effort to rationalize man's adjustment to that as yet overwhelming problem. It took that relentless experimentalism, that untrenched faith, to drive the salt out of the sands of the Dead Sea. There it has lain for centuries. Hope. Along comes a person with 148 young orphans making up his mind that somehow there must be a way of rationalizing that relationship and exploiting the possibilities of that richer with its pall of salt. And they found out how to do it. Their observation of a geranium plant cracks the secret. The land of irrigation, the land of hospitals, it's the land of human husbandry, it's the land of public health. Henry Zold, the leader of public health back in 1913, said when a mosquito bites an Arab, the mosquito bites a Jew. Take the code of ethics. Take a code of ethics. The balances that rationalizes men's relationship to their own kind. And what can one say of the author of Islam? Egoism, opportunism, and desperation. This is the land of the lottery. And Mrs. Sharp and I arrived in Madrid in the summer of 1940 after the Spanish Civil War. The walls were plastered with gray lottery uh, placards calling upon the nation to produce the new University of Madrid by a national lottery. The full gamut of desperation in this Mediterranean world, born out of the rigidity of the caste system, the pitiless indifference to others' misfortunes, the failure to rationalize, the failure to rationalize and to organize the lofty ethical precepts of the Quran. I think I can say to you that a young lad or a young girl growing up in Cairo has these four choices for the way of earning a living. Theft or mendicancy, or violence, or deceit. 
There is even a prayer for a person about to deceive a person dying in his shop, and there is a prayer for a burglar both before he goes out on his night's round and after he comes back. Allah must be propitiated before he starts out to cut somebody's throat or to steal a purse. And during the war when I was there, there were 435 purses stolen from British and other Allied soldiers every week in Cairo. And if he is successful, he owes Allah a prayer on return. These are facts. These are ingrown and inrooted customs. Theft, mendicancy, violence, and deceit. You have read occasionally of riots against foreign property in some of the large cities of the Arab world. Those have been interpreted to you as riots caused by chauvinism, by a desire to express national destiny and to insist upon national destiny and the removal of troops. I lived through one of those and watched it. In the space of about a half an hour, using traffic standards, the mob of about 5,000 people, about like our Cicero, Illinois mob of three weeks ago, destroyed $100,000 worth of plate glass windows and the valuable goods that were behind them. What made the people act that way? Just one word of four letters, and it's spelled L-O-O-T, loot. Loot was which to get something to eat, get something to wear. In a world which economically is a vast black market, where the $64 question is how shall the Arab farmer pay for his galabia, this long flannel Calvin Coolidge type of nighting, which during the day they belt up and during the night they sleep in, because many of them have to sleep out of doors or sleep with their animals. What is the answer of Israel? Well, Israel is no company of angels, but the answer of Israel seems to be, and I am a goy, a, a Gentile, the code of righteousness, the code of social solidarity, including the Arabs, the code of social fluidity, the code that leaves room for a man to hope that he can be better, more able, live longer than his father, the code that leaves room for social imagination and concern. I want to make it perfectly clear that I'm not whitewashing the nation of Israel. I have very deep criticisms to advance for the attempt of the Orthodox party in Israel to dominate religious education in that country. And Dr. Hein Weizmann needs the support of world opinion in his effort to prevent the establishment of a theocracy, an antique Orthodox theocracy in Israel. And in government circles behind the scenes, there is plenty of infighting and slugging and dirty work at the crossroads. But through it and above it and beyond it all, there seems to be a code of social solidarity the code that finally rationalizes people's relationships about the controlling idea, the shape of things to come, loyalty to the state. Take the question of land tenure. Professor Crane Brinton of Harvard says that a revolution can be defined in this way, a basic shift in real estate property titles. Professor Brinton says he's a world authority on revolution. Professor Brinton Crane Brinton says that a revolution occurs when there has been a basic shift in real estate property ownership. I have no time more than simply to sketch what a burden, what an old man of the sea, the feudalism, the feudalism of land tenure is in the Mediterranean world. The tenant farmers, the wives, the children, and in the Arab world, sleeping with, working with the buffalo. This is the life of the fellahim the life of the peasant. It is an economics of grunt and grow, an economics of primary physical effort to achieve anything like immediate rationalization, anything like an exchange of the products of the earth and of industry. The answer of Judaism is the answer of commonwealth. We're thinking of land tenure now. The answer of commonwealth, of land held in common, I am perfectly free to say, and they would wish me to, that it's a socialist economy. There is no doubt about it at all. And I believe that that is the middle way in the Far East. Everyone sharing, everyone serving, everyone receiving from the precious resources of the earth. Everyone concerned about the use of water. Everyone concerned about the use of humans. The good Jew has a sense of humans. 
He will not burn anything, the decay of which can put the flesh back upon those wasted hills, those hills where the rock has come out and the good earth has gone down to the sea for centuries because the trees were cut. Take manufacturing finance and commerce. Here. In general, one can say, with some exceptions, that it's an economics of grunt and groan, a primitive barter system still throughout the Arab world. We're not blaming them, we're simply describing it. It's a, an area of tent industry, an area of pastoral pursuit, of hand labor. Our distinguished socialist friend, Dr. Lohar, who was speaking to a group of us in Chicago the other day, said, consider the plight of India, and India adjoins this me Middle East and Mediterranean world. The per capita industrial investment in this country in America is $2,000. In India, it is $30 per capita. The answer of Judaism, and they would be the first to say, due to the loyalty and the imagination of Jews over the wide world, those who were not ravaged by Hitler, has been the full elaboration of manufacturing currency in the exchange of goods. Free economic rationalizations, if you will, and I beg you to hear that word several times because that is the motto, that is the guiding spirit of what is going on in this little land at the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea. Free rationalization, cooperative, private investment, and state capitalism. Working together, quarreling together a good deal of the time, but working together. Their leaders looking beyond the immediate quarrel, looking beyond the immediate target to, to the economic welfare of the state. Union labor in Israel faces the greatest problem of adult education that union labor anywhere in the world has ever faced. It's called Hissadrut. Union labor is called Hissadrut there. When I was in Israel last, the export from Israel was 10 cents and the import into Israel was a dollar. No nation can continue with that system, that inequity, that imbalance. And Hissadrut, the leaders of Hissadrut, the shop stewards, the rank and file, are coming to learn what they must do to reduce their standard of living while capital investments are being made in the land. The target in Israel is $2,500 capital investment for every person living there to redress that balance. Take government. Take the institution of government to legalize relationships with people. The feudal caste system very largely the opportunism of the freebooters, the aggression of the chief, and the defeatism of millions. And the answer of Judaism is democracy in its best and in its worst, but democracy, representative government. I can make the assertion, and I'm supported in this by an official of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to whom I asked the question, I can make the assertion that behind every Israeli spokesman today, is a mandate, a direct mandate of the people, a free secret ballot, or his choice as an official by a representative chosen by the people. Those are the two ways in which government is carried on in a democracy. By the use of a free secret ballot, choosing a man like a legislator, a man like the President of the United States, and then delegating to him the selection of a civil servant. I can only report that there was a high degree, a high degree of common cause, a sense of common cause that motivates the operations of democracy in this land. And now we come to the last one. I may come back to religion because I want to say something about it. But we come now to The Shape of Things to Come. H.G. Wells' is title, The Shape of Things to Come. What is the social dream and hope? What is the sense of the future? Well, as near as I could find out, and I must tell you that I do not speak Arabic, but live for months with those who do, as far as I can find out, there is no social greed. They've never had any social institution that led them to love it, and live for it, and die willingly for it, to plan for it, and to sacrifice for it. It seems to me, as social sociologists and clergymen report upon the sense of or the shape of things to come in the Arab world, they are highly personalized egoism, otherworldly refuge fantasies, chiefly having to do with two basic human appetites, sex and eating. Violent fluctuations mark the Arab temperament between despair and daydreaming. 
Under the Quran, no alcohol can be consumed by a believer in Islam. I did not know until I got to that world that there is a substitute for alcohol which is called hashish. And hashish provides the same flight from stern reality which alcohol provides in the Western world for those who can get it. What's the answer of Judaism to this question? What do the people dream about? What is the shape of things to come? The answer of a Judaism which is bringing in today a thousand years came in and they said, let us plant eucalyptus trees and the eucalyptus trees will drink up the water, will provide us shade and firewood and the mosquitoes cannot live in these fens anymore. Today, Arabs and Jews are farming the land around those eucalyptus trees where once it was death to enter as a peasant farmer. That's what I mean by rationalizing. That's what I mean by exploitation. Merciless, ceaseless, patient exploitation of the problem involved in man's survival with his fellow men and with the great impersonal forces like mosquitoes because the mosquito is a great impersonal force in the Middle East. I think the motto might be described as one world at a time, this one now, and this one better now. One world at a time, this one better, and this one better now. In other words, there was a very vivid concept of the dignity of the present moment, the significance of the present moment, and the old pietism which led, have led so many in the Middle East to think of the destiny of man as something to be uh, predicated upon a future state, pie in the sky by and by, as the IWW put it in my youth, that has gone. The present organic life of men is considered a good, a good in the ethical sense. These are the ten cardinal institutions as I see them. One further word may be said about religion. One night we would be late in going to tea, and I said very impatiently, why can't we go to tea? And a friend of mine said, it is sunset, and the chauffeur is at his prayer. Indeed he was. He was in the garden with his prayer rug, and he was praying. One comes back to the Middle East with a very great reverence for the power of religion in the life of the Arab. The power of religion in the lives of those living in the impoverished and uncertain economy of the northern arc of the Mediterranean Sea. One comes back asking himself whether the great sense of trans transcendental vertical mysticism could not somehow be balanced by the lateral, the mercy of compassion, the organized brought out mercies of compassion. You know, the British built a great hospital in Cairo. It is one of the biggest hospitals in the world, but it has no screens in it. And so the horrible flies from the Nile Valley enter and bite people. And persons who are wounded, mothers who are given birth to children if they can afford to go to that hospital, have to have a fly nurse to wave a fan over them all the time to keep the flies from biting them and bringing them loathsome diseases from the shores of the Nile, which is just a very few feet from the walls of the hospital. No thought, failure to rationalize one great final step in sanitation. A Roman Catholic friend of mine, a beloved boy who's come to this country studying at, at Georgetown University in, in Washington, became a volunteer medical worker to fight trachoma in the eyes of the Egyptian children. And at the peril of himself, and he got it on one of these occasions, and you can't get it more than once without imperiling your own eyesight, one of these occasions, on many of these occasions, he went out to these villages. And the mothers would say to him, if God wills that my child should be blind, the child will be blind, and then we can station him as a beggar. Who dreaded, I raise the question finally, who dreaded and thought this social sense and this sense and this social engineering in the Middle East that Israel represents? Who has brought this idea and structure of commonwealth? The owners and the foreign exploiters and the would-be exploiters of this area, where we see the oldest continuous institutions of the Western world. In this area is the Nile Valley, one of the two sources of human civilization on this earth, earth and to the east of it is the Tigris-Euphrates Valley, a source, another source of civilization. The feudal Arab chieftains fought this 
coming of Israel. The importers into the black market economy of the Middle East fought it. When I was in Cairo, lipsticks were selling for $12.50 a piece, and an aspirin tablet was selling for 50 cents a piece. The persons who were ascribed of the black market in drugs did not want Jewish know-how and Jewish financial genius to come in and produce aspirin tablets at 35 cents a bottle and lipsticks at 25 cents a piece. And they organized the Arab League to prevent this. The Arab League was organized in six of the great industrial cities of England, and it was shoved upon the cabinet of Winston Churchill. The authority for that was an importer in Cairo who was benefiting from the machinations of the Arab League. Foreign manufacturers, foreign exploiters of mineral resources, and be it said to their shame, two branches of Christendom opposed the coming of this kind of social engineering. And the social teachers, the um, social servants of those two branches of Christendom ought to have been wise enough, ought to have been compassionate and foresighted enough. Yeah. Long since to have prayed for the coming of Israel, the return of the cycle of Israel to the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea. Who wanted the social and the economic affairs to remain as they had always been for centuries? Those whose bets are placed upon a monopoly scarcity economy. For let me tell you, the whole great Mediterranean world is a black market. I think it is probably the most monstrous black market in the world. And those who bet upon a scarcity, a monopoly scarcity economy, have bet upon the continuance of conditions. This economy, profiteered upon by a cabal of a few sharp traders, working upon the hopeless, illiterate, servile, acquiescent, otherworldly fatalism of the people there, getting the price they want because there is no competition. They don't believe in free enterprise at all. They are a stride of a monopoly in drugs, a monopoly in textiles, a monopoly in steel, and they intend to remain astride that monopoly. They intend to milk that area for all their work. They don't want aspirin tablets prepared in a land where everybody has headaches from sandfly fever and from sunstroke, where in our UNRWA camps we had agonized appeals for aspirin and aspirin, um, and aspirin, uh, the kindred of aspirin. They don't want those things available and cheap. The Mediterranean arcs to the area of the oldest continuous traditions of the Western world. The Mediterranean world today is paying a price for too many centuries of monologues, too much dictation. Dictation from the palace, dictation from the pulpit, dictation from the mosque. And these have been undisciplined for 3,000 years. The sins of the fathers have visited upon the children unto the third and the fourth and the fortieth generation. And what is the price as one lives in this world, this Mediterranean world? What is the price? The price is fragmentation, silence, inanition, fatalism. In an area of tired, monolithic, static, centripetal, reminiscent institutions. Italy slumped into fascism in 1922. And the other name for Portugal might be nostalgia, memory. The word in Portugal is that centuries ago we were the people of Prince Henry the Navigator. The substance of man is hope and reflection. Men must be able to bear witness to a story of social justice, a story of the rationalization of their resources, a story of the rationalization of the conflict of man with man through court and media of government. And this story, my friends, must come up into their own times. This story must come up into their own times. They must be able to see some of the milestones. They must be able to plant the milestones themselves. And if a generation of men cannot bear that witness, they will account to God and to their fellows with fatalism, because they must account with fatalism. Fatalism is the way out, the bowed head, the face in the hands, the shrugged shoulders, the hands lifted empty and futile to the skies, bearing no burden. They must account to God and man for fatalism, and then they will be warned that opiate religion is the opiate of the people. I can only report to you, with, it, with the best goodwill in the world, that all of the southern arc of the Mediterranean world, and much of the northern arc of the Mediterranean world, 
is still settling its account with this resort of fatalism and of violence is still to come. At this moment of light, a light old and new has been brought to the Mediterranean world. And I think that a trumpet call sounds in the desert, and the two notes of that trumpet call are intelligence and compassion. Organized pity, organized intelligence, organized reflection, the use of the inductive method with which to rationalize three basic relationships of life, the relationship of man to man, the relationship of man to the state, the relationship of man to the full range of non-human adversities, sickness, death, failure, the miscarriage of hopes and plans. In the relationship of man to man, personal conflict and competition, man's personal conflict and competition with his kind, there seems to be a quality of fraternity, there seems to be a quality of grim jesting in which the personal pronoun is we rather than you, a rugged courtesy, and more than anything else, an appetite for dialogue. The Jews have never been patient with monologues. In the area of the relationship of man to the state, the state is conceived of as a means, as an instrument, as a rationalization, and not as some majestic momentum justifying itself by centuries of its existence. It seems to be among our friends the Jews in that little land no bigger than Vermont, at the eastern end of the Mediterranean, there seems to be an appetizing zest for the paradoxes of democracy. First, that periodically in a free and secret ballot, the majority of people will decide what their good means and will vote that good. And second, that there are inalienable rights of the individual held sacred from the will of the majority, no matter how big the majority is. There seems to be an appetite for the tension, for the paradox, if you will, of democracy. And in the relationship of man to the full range of non-human adversity, relentless experimentalism, unceasing experimentalism that burns the midnight oil until the dawn comes. Exploitation there. And in the house in the desert, the film I referred to shows you how that bore fruit on the shores of the Dead Sea. My most moving recollection out of two trips to Israel, one when I was in the British Army and second last year at Easter time, is a sense of a zone of objective worth, an area of validity in consciences of most men and women and youth, an area of validity lying beyond bringing discipline to bear upon all nearer goals, all persons, all plans, all party targets. I call this a sense of commonwealth. May I leave that with you? I come back and share with you, at a time of national need for this in our own life, the sense unique, as far as I can see in the Mediterranean world, this sense of an area of validity, an area of objective worth, lying beyond party plans, lying beyond the conflict of man with man. These people are taking in a thousand refugees a day. They have taken in enough people since May of 1948 to be an equivalent of 80 million immigrants into the United States. That's the disproportion of the newcomers to the old timers. These people speak 42 languages. They are carriers of 42 cultures. And yet they can verbalize. They can communicate. They can see signals hoisted by the sabra. I hope there's at least one person here who knows what a sabra is in Israel. The sabra is the prickly payer, the girl or boy who was born in Israel and feels a birthright claim upon the soil. These boys and girls, old women, old men, hopelessly sick, persons coming bedridden with cancer and tuberculosis from all the ghettos of Europe and of the Arab world, these people, carriers of 42 cultures, seem able to verbalize, hoist signals, and understand signals. These are the six most precious words in this land. Trees, children, water, humus, peace, and the land. And they always spell the land with a capital L. It means Eret Israel. Theirs is the bedrock, the ultimate, the persistent understanding essential to the creation and the maintenance of the nation. It obtains and is obtained in Holland. It obtains and is obtained in Denmark in Australia and in Finland. 
it is blowing out in the wind in France today. Israel has brought the quality of Walt Whitman, his love of America, to the Mediterranean world. To symbolize commonwealth in hope and memory, to rationalize commonwealth in the plan and the blueprint, to structurize commonwealth in the institutions of intelligence and the institutions of compassion, to organize pity, to put the nurses in uniform and to give them test tubes and to give them syringes and to send them to mothers in labor and to keep them with the children, taking the silver nitrate to turn back the dread germs of Pacoma, not saying if God wills my son shall be blind and I shall sell him into, into beggary, but rationalizing bringing intelligence and compassion to bear upon the problem of relating man to man, man to the state, and man to the vast area of subhuman concepts. I can only tell you this. Amos and Isaiah have come back from 2,000 years of exile, carrying the word of the Lord in one hand, and in the other hand, the test tube and the syringe and the scoping wrench. 